one. Hi, I'm Justin Boyd. Hi, I'm George Luna. Hey, I'm Brittany Pacheco, and I'm in a TV. Frank Cooper. And I'm Nathan Hale, and we are the Watchers in the Basement. Welcome to another edition of the Watchers in the Basement, a uh, special episode because, guys, the MCU is back. Phase four is underway, and we're here to talk all about it. The uh, start of WandaVision, which is the first uh, Marvel Studios show dropped on Disney Plus last <clears throat> Friday. We're here on uh, WandaVision Wednesday. Hopefully this becomes a thing. Uh, use the hashtag WandaVision Wednesday. Um, the uh, the show the show dropped, like I said, last Friday. They decided to drop two episodes. And I think from here on out, they're just going to have one episode each Friday, kind of like Mandalorian did. And from what I've read, there's seven episodes to go. But uh, let's start off with the first two episodes. Let's just kick it around. What are y'all's overall thoughts of WandaVision? I'll, uh, I'll go to Brittany first, since you're stuck in a TV. What do you think about WandaVision, Brittany? Uh, right off the bat, I was a little concerned because, you know, you kind of compare it to maybe that of Mandalorian. It was it was a slow burn. It had its moments, but it almost took to the very end. Actually, it took to the very end to get to the good stuff. Um, so that first episode was kind of like, all right, well, maybe so. I, I thought it was charming with the the nods to like the 1950s and 1960s way of television. Um, but the second episode, you know, was a lot better. And I'm very curious as to how this whole story is going to progress. Um, Frank, what about you? You know what? Very few times when I watch the TV show, I, I, I don't know what to expect. Like, I knew nothing as far as, like, what to expect regarding this show. I didn't know what the show was going to be about. Like, the, the trailer was very ambiguous. So episode one... I feel like I was watching like the 2021 version of the Dick Van Dyke show. It was very, I'm, I'm, a, big, I'm, a, I'm a big Dick Van Dyke fan, but um, it was very poignant, very corny, yet we at the same time. Um, I don't know what to expect. I don't know what to make of it, but I know I like it, <laughs> if that makes sense. Like, I, I want to know what, what more transpires. And, um, yeah, the, the the first two episodes are very very ambiguous, but it's it's leaving me wanting more. What about you, George? I, I I think the same thing, Frank. Like it was, I'm not really a fan of like the old school shows like that. I've never really like other than I Love Lucy. I've never seen any other show in black and white, honestly. But um, the the comedy was just like it, it was very cheesy for my taste. But uh, I, I get it. It's a Marvel Disney type thing, but I'm sure eventually as the story goes on and they did I think they did all this stuff for a reason. Like everything was black and white till uh, we get towards the end. And then there's small little Easter eggs of things that are happening. And we kind of, I'm, I'm excited to see what, how this story unfolds and how it's going to relate to the MCU. And, uh, but overall the first episode wasn't that great. Second one was a lot better. But you, Nathan, what are your thoughts on WandaVision? Uh, it's it's honestly a lot what I expected. Just from the trailers, I expected something kind of like, you know, the Donna Reed show, Leave it to Beaver, that kind of thing. Um, and it hit on all the marks of the, the cheesy humor that you would expect from those shows. Uh, I was a little nervous that, you know, we, we weren't getting anything more than that until we got the little... Uh, till they kind of alluded at the very end of the first episode that there was something further deeper going on. And I agree with uh, George, like this, the second episode really kicked it up quite a few notches. Uh, and I'm just wondering like where she is, like I, I, she's in her mind. I don't know that she's in a physical place per se. I think her body is, but I think this is all perhaps in her mind, but I'm not even sure of that because we are talking about Scarlet Witch and she can literally sculpt and shape reality. So I don't know if this is something on her part, like she's created this as almost like a defense mechanism or if someone's doing this in a way to her. So I'm really curious, but 
hearing that you know voice over the radio sounds like someone's trying to reach her um i don't know I, i'm i'm very curious to see where they take this but you know the question is i don't know that she wants to be reached because i think it i think she has created this alternate reality and it's it's kind of um it's kind of apropos because like think about people uh you know people there's a lot of escape escapism when you watch tv and so she's basically escaped her life you know the things that have happened after infinity war in game of vision dying and she's kind of escaped to tv you know to these to these old shows that maybe she grew up watching or something like i know you know all these older shows were on nick nick at night and on those kind of channels when i was growing up so i saw i saw some of this stuff it wasn't for me but i i saw it on often and i think that the show does a really good job of kind of uh you know portraying those shows really accurately you know really well and it to me this show just shows you like there's a huge difference in marvel and star wars like this show is so well made whereas the Mandal- mandalorian i mean it's got had cool moments and it's fun but it's not it's not it doesn't have the same kind of it doesn't have like, like that marvel sheen that marvel you know glisten you know like there's certainly the marvel that it just looks better than other things this mm-hmm. definitely has mm-hmm. that so but, so one thing real quick um and towards the end of the show i'll be sharing my little uh trivia finds but frank earlier you mentioned about how uh this show reminded you that of dick van dyke's show and it's funny that you mentioned that and i'm not sure if the rest of y'all know this but dick van dyke actually was a consultant for the show uh because the the interior set design was very reminiscent of of his show and I, and it just warms my heart frank that you you mentioned that first um i didn't know that about you actually that you, you're a huge fan of dick van dyke and and you watched the show and like i said um it's it's charming to see how marvel is uh, kind of playing homage to these old shows, the I Love Lucy, Bewitched, uh, Honeymooners, um, even I Dream, uh, I Dream a Genie. And it's, it's such a very, like kids today, I say kids, like I'm, <laughs> I'm that young. Uh, kids today really won't know these old shows that a lot of us have seen or grew up with. And it's just kind of like, let's reintroduce it to them, but with these, these characters and and justin i think you and i had talked about this off screen about how these avengers were not really like the a team kind of avengers so the fact that there's this show and by the way it's also marvel's first original series um they created the show with these what b team c team Avengers. yeah i mean i mean if we're comparing like let's say like iron man and captain america are like jordan and pippen on the bulls you know, Vision and and uh, in uh, Wanda Maximoff, that's like Judd Bushler and you know Bill Winnington or something. These are, I mean, if you're a Bulls fan, you're down for it. But if you're not, you probably don't know these guys. And so, to me, once again, it shows you how awesome uh, my phone's acting crazy. Um, it shows you how um, how awesome Marvel is and how you know, like, what a flex by them to to do this, like to kick off a phase. Now it wasn't intentional because obviously with the pandemic, you know, black widow was supposed to kick off phase four and we were supposed to get winter soldier and Falcon and the winter soldier before this show. But to be able to do that and to use that creativity, it's, it's kind of incredible. But then also, I mean, we know we're watching the show that we know there's more to it. It's not just these cheesy sitcoms from, from years past, like there's more to it. And I think that's the thing that I like the most about it is it's like a giant mystery. I mean, it's a mystery to not only to us, the audience, but it's a mystery to the characters themselves. I mean, they openly admit they don't know what they're doing there. They don't know their names in certain respects. They don't know how they got there, what wedding days or rings and stuff like that. And uh, I think, you know, it's just, it's a really impressive like thing for Marvel to do that. And to, like you said, Brittany, to take characters that are complimentary at best that, you know, I don't think people would want to go see a WandaVision movie per se, but you put it on Disney Plus, make it a nine episode series. And I think it's something that can slowly build into something that can later on lead to the Doctor Strange movie or the Spider-Man movie that's in development. I mean, all these things are all tied in because it's all Marvel. So um, so are we going to are we going to see more of these? Are we going to see like uh, Happy Days down the road here? 
Marvel I, Happy Days? I think they are. <laughs> I mean, honestly, the Brady Bunch, I think, is the next kind of type show. And I've even heard they're going to do, you know, once they get to like the 2000s, they're going to do The Office. That's oh, been a rumor. Oh, my God. Yes. <laughs> because, I mean, you think about it, the first episode is the 50s, second episode is the 60s, 60s, 70s is coming up. And so, you know, you're, you keep ticking off the year and the decades, like you're going to get to. Will they have like a Seinfeld or a Cheers like episode or I don't know. I mean, at a certain point, that part of the show is going to go away because if you watch the trailer, especially the latest one on Disney Plus, it's not all sitcoms and stuff. There's definitely action that looks like a Marvel movie that's coming. Um, you know, probably the last three or four episodes is my guess. Um, but you know, let's get into the first episode. Let's let's kind of break it down because there's a lot of Easter eggs and there's a lot of little things to like notice. And that's part of what I like about it. Like I said, it's a mystery, and you're you have to like watch everything and see all the little details. And honestly, like y'all know me, I'm not a huge. I didn't grow up with the comics. I mean, I knew some of the characters, but I didn't grow up with this stuff. And so I didn't know anything about these characters until the MCU. But there, there's a lot of backstory with these characters, and a lot of that stuff is shown in the show. And so um, let's just kind of get into the first episode. The first episode is the basic plot is there's a surprise dinner party that Vision's boss, like they're throwing a surprise party for Vision's boss and his wife. But Wanda and Vision, they don't know why this certain day is circled in their calendar. What's significant about that? Um, And that was such a, that that kind of situation is like such a common situation for those old kind of shows. True, always like yeah, these, yeah those trusts. There's always something wacky going on. And then there's the part where, where you know, Vision calls her from work and he's he's worried about the dinner and she thinks it's just like for their anniversary. And there's a miscommunication and a misunderstanding. It always leads to some kind of wacky humor. Um, so the way they did that was like was perfect. And I think Paul Bettany and Elizabeth Olsen are so good such good actors and like you really get to see them do all kinds of stuff and be silly and be funny and it's not just about superpowers and magic and stuff um but let's get to one of the other characters that we see early in the first episode and that's uh a character by the name of agnes she is the kind of annoying neighbor <laughs> who comes over you know perfectly played by katherine hahn and uh, Nathan, I don't know if you've uh, if you've read anything about this, but do you know who Agnes supposedly is from the Marvel comics? Not a clue. I, I didn't even recognize I, uh, that there would be a Marvel comparison. I know that she was very much a trope from all of those TV shows back in the day. Uh, every every show had them. Leave it to Beaver. It was a uh, was it Wally. Or was it Wally's friend? But there was always a character like that in every one of those shows growing up. Yeah. So I didn't realize there was a Marvel um, comparison there. Right. So apparently this Agnes neighbor character, she is actually a character named Agatha Harkness, who is a who is a witch and who apparently in the comics is a mentor of Wanda's. And then later on, she's like a villain, you know, like a, it's like a mentor turned, you know, uh, rival. And uh, I, wanna, I thought that was interesting. Go ahead, Brittany. I, I want to kind of pick on Frank a little bit because Frank, out of all of us, I think you're probably like the biggest on comic books. So, I mean, in in, in regards to any of, of what we're discussing right now about Agnes or now this Agatha person, I mean, did you have any knowledge about anything that deals with the Scarlet Witch and, and Vision, that comic series? Uh, absolutely not. The the comic books I've read were um, Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver. Uh, yeah, that that more that storyline because in the comic books that those are Magneto's children. Mm-hmm. So I know about I know about that and where they grew up and Magneto finding out that those were his, his kids years years later. This this whole uh, incarnation of of Scarlet Witch and and Vision this is totally new to me and. I made it a I made it a point not to go back and read anything regarding these two because I wanted to be completely surprised. Um, so is this um, based around the Ultimates timeline? Yeah, it, it, it's it's not the it's not from the six four six timeline. This is a different. This is the Ultimates timeline for sure. It's not. Yeah, so like this is all like all the alternate timeline of the comic book I never really read. Um, outside of the Age of Apocalypse, so mm-hmm. this is all new information to me, and I love it. By the way, Dick Van Dyke is still alive. 
That's crazy. That's what yeah. I thought when you said that. I was like, wait, what? Yeah. He's yeah. hundred by now, right? Uh, he's he's in his nineties for yeah. sure. Oh, he's wow. he's still kicking. I mean, he was in the in the the latest uh, Mary Poppins too. He had a he had a small cameo um, as the old banker. So um, yeah, but that's I mean, a sidebar. That's there's that's rumors he's playing Superman in the next movie. <laughs> Is, he, is that not true? I mean, well, I, he's, no. There's it's multiple universes. He's gonna be in the Flash one. He's playing the young Superman. The young Superman. Uh, Nathan, that's actually Superboy. Okay. Like, oh, right. okay. Uh, Titans up in here. Come on, man. Um, George, George, I want to ask yeah. you. Are you big on reading comics or anything like that? Because I have, I, ha- I haven't like got into it like Frank has. Like I've been wanting to read those Boyd's ones, but I know they're stuck at the office. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, so I have a, I have like a theory of what's going on, and th- this is me just throwing you know mud against the wall. So, you know, Scarlet Witch or Wanda has the ability to alter reality. Like she, she, you know, the House of M storyline. She. Uh, the comic book, she depowered like 95% of the mutants in that storyline. So I'm thinking after Thanos kills Vision, um, I'm thinking why she vaporized, this is her like her PTSD kicking in, kicking in right now. And I'm thinking that she was she was so distraught losing uh Vision that she she's in she's in her own alternate reality. And from things yeah. that I've read um, leading up to Doctor Strange's sequel, I know Scarlet Witch is in that sequel, uh, Multiverse of Madness, I want to say. It sounded like there was a guy on the radio calling out to her. Could that guy be Doctor Strange? See, I I don't personally think so. I think um, we're going to have, I think we're going to have callbacks to different characters from other MCU movies that are going to be featured in this show how how soon i don't know um i don't think it's dr strange because trust me i know benedict cumberbatch's voice very well it's not him um does it does it come to you at night his voice (laughs) in your dreams you don't need to know what happens (laughs) with me at night you just you don't need to know about that Um, how does he say penguin (laughs) <laughs> i love that i absolutely love that about him it's like you're british you can't say penguin what the hell penguin anyway, Peng- penguin. Penguin. <laughs> um y'all need to go check out graham norton if you have no idea what we're talking about it's awesome um anyway no i actually thought maybe it would have been um captain america because well, we'll kind of go into that later. There's some MCU news dealing with, you know, uh, Captain America. I thought maybe it would be him. I thought then maybe it could be like Bucky or even Hawkeye. Because because think about Civil War. Hawkeye was the one who came for Wanda at the compound when all the stuff was going on. So I thought maybe we'll, we get to see Hawkeye because, as we know, he has his own show that's going to happen on Disney+. Plus. So I thought like they were going to be all kind of interconnected at some point. Um, I think there's definitely going to be other characters from the MCU that are going to be in WandaVision. So, um, George, who did you think maybe could be on the radio? No, I agree with you. That makes a lot more sense if it was, uh, the, yeah, what, what's his name? Hawkeye. <laughs> Hawkeye, yeah. <laughs> either Hawkeye Jeremy or, Renner. Uh, or Falcon, too. So, either, either one of those, I don't know. It, Hawkeye's getting his own show, by the way? Yep. Yeah. He's really? got his own show. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Currently in this new show, too. Uh, female Hawkeye as well. Yeah. Is it his daughter? No, it's. it's. Yeah, her name's Kate Bishop, right? And that's yeah, the. Uh, yeah. That's her name. Yeah. Not okay. Daughter. Okay. She's like he, a. Go ahead. I know he was training his daughter at the end of the. Uh, like, it was like Endgame or something. I, that's what I was wondering. Mm hmm. Yeah, because he did he did call her a Hawkeye before she, they all disappeared. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's uh, I, definitely Frank, not Benedict Cumberbatch. I know that man's voice, especially when he says Penguin. Um, anyway, but uh, Nathan and Justin, who did y'all think could be on the radio? Nathan, why don't you go ahead because I yeah. actually know who it is. Oh, okay. Well, good. Really? Um, I, I liked your... Uh, the theory you had about um, 
uh, Frank regarding, you know, that, you know, not in game, but Infinity War, that that was, you know, her kind of like when Vision died. But but she was one of the ones who disappeared when he snapped his fingers and we saw her go to dust so that not entirely, but mostly dispels that theory. Uh, as far as who's on the radio, um, I don't know. My first thought, honestly, the first thought that came to mind was Captain America, but um, that was just who popped into my head. I have no idea who it actually is, but that's just who popped in my head when I heard that voice. Um, but since you actually know who it is, Justin, I'm going to turn it over to you. Justin, before you answer. So, yep. Vince, do you, think these, do you think these events are leading up to Infinity War? After. No, no, this is no. I think this is after. Okay. This is after Infinity War. So, like, this is after Endgame, and I, I think that, like, I didn't think it was Captain America because in this world there is no Captain America right now. Now that's going to be addressed in a few weeks. Like, literally two months from now, we're going to have Falcon and the Winter Soldier going to start. And every Friday, we're going to be talking about these shows, this, the episodes of this show. But, but I thought, uh, like George and like Frank, Frank, like you mentioned before, and, and Brittany too. Hawkeye made a lot of sense. I thought it was either Hawkeye. The Falcon makes a lot of sense because you think about like an end game where, you know, Captain America hears him on the radio. He hears him like, you know, Cap on your left or whatever. Uh, so that made sense to me. But I did a little bit of research, and it's a character who's actually in the trailer. So if you want me to spoil it, I can. It's not a huge character. It's probably a character you probably don't even remember. I mean, you remember the actor, but you don't remember him in the movie. Um, it's actually – go ahead. Lay it on me. It's uh, FBI agent Jimmy Wu from Ant Man, played by Randall Park. Huh. You know the funny, the funny yeah, guy. Yeah, the one like, who yeah. he it was going to go on the uh, wanted to know about going on a dinner date or whatever with with. Uh, right. <laughs> wait a minute! Wait a minute! Wait a minute! You're talking about Asian Jim from The Office? Oh, Asian Jim. Yes, Asian <laughs> Jim. So he he um, he has a big role in this because. Not only is he an FBI agent, he's a former S.H.I.E.L.D. agent, as we learned in, in Ant-Man. And so, you know, he's on the case looking for Wanda. I, it's, I think, like, the government's looking for her because after Endgame, they're trying to track down these, these like, quote-unquote weapons, which uh, the word weapon kind of gets me to some other stuff in, the, in this first two episodes. I don't know if y'all noticed, but, and I wasn't aware of this either, but the logo for S.W.O.R.D., which is a yeah. like shield. It's a, it's on a group the helicopter. Is on the little helicopter we see in the second episode. It's on the commercial with the watch. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I believe it was it, in the room with the radio that, too. That, that, in the radio, yeah. Yeah, so yeah Hydra was Hydra. on the watch. Hydra was on the watch. Yeah, you're right. Okay, so let's let's get into that. Let's get into the commercials and like all the Easter eggs we noticed. And I'm going to kick it over to Brittany because I know she's really passionate about the uh, was it the toaster or the watch? Which one? Both. I mean, I, I both. Can, okay. I can let's talk about the. Let's do the toaster first, since it was an episode one. Yeah. So I thought, first of all, it was really interesting that there was like a commercial break because it's like we're watching a show within a show. You know what I'm saying? It's so it's kind of like this show, WandaVision. You know, who is watching this show, right? Right. Like, um, and so we have that commercial break. So the first commercial break that we see, period, is the Toastmate. 2000 from Stark Industries. And even before we found out who the company was, if you really listen to the toaster as it's operating, you hear the actual Iron Man suit power down sound. Um, I don't know how uh, other, I don't know another way to like say that. Repulsor repulsor sound? Is that what you're talking about? Well, basically, it just makes a sound as when the Iron Man suit just shuts down. So you, you okay. can go back and listen to it because obviously it's it's uh, it's toasting. It's doing its thing, right? But also notice that in the commercial, like the show, everything is black and white except the color red that you see with yep. the with the little light that's blinking, you know, to let mm-hmm. you know that you know toasters, you know, doing its thing. Um, so yeah, Stark Industries, which is very you know appropriate because obviously Stark Industries, as we know, has been around for quite some time. You know, Howard Stark helped uh, you know create Captain America, if you will. So this is what? You know, no way. I know. It's it's spoiler. So <laughs> Shocking. Yeah. 
Um, so yeah, the Toastmate 2000 from Stark Industries has the Iron Man suit power down sound, um, which, like I said, was really interesting. Um, do you want me to go ahead and jump into the second commercial from the second episode? Yeah, let's go ahead and knock out the commercials. All right, perfect. So uh, with the second commercial, we see it's it's about a watch, you know, because as we know, you know, uh, a man, you know, has something on his arm, which is be his lady friend. And then, you know, he has the watch on the other hand. And and immediately when I saw that it says Strucker, because it's it's a I'm guessing it's German. Um, I'm like, oh, hell, I saw that name plus the Hydra's logo. And I'm like, oh, that was the dude who experimented on the Maximoff twins. That's mm-hmm. like the beginning of um, Age of Ultron that we saw. That's the, inter- the true introduction of the Maximoff, tw- Maximoff twins. And on that kind of subject of the um, commercials, I do want to say that you can kind of relate it, these commercials specifically to each main character, being that of Vision and um, Wanda. So you can argue that Vision was created by Ultron but then like brought to life by Tony Stark and Bruce Banner, thus the Stark Industries commercial in episode one. And then um, Strucker, as I said, you know, was the one who was experimenting on Wanda in uh, episode two. So I just thought that was kind of a really interesting nod to yeah, that's like, a cool their, parallel there. their origins, you know what I'm saying? Um, so yeah, I was really, I was really taken aback by one of these, uh, you know, these commercials in general, but um yeah. That, well, that does beg one question, though. Go for it. Can the Vision, can he toast toast that well as well? <laughs> I don't know. But I, I saw I some he stuff. he has gum in his system. <laughs> right. It's all gummed up. I saw in the, apparently in the comics, the older comics, uh, people referred to Vision as a toaster. Like That was like a, a put down for him. And so... The toaster head, I guess, was kind of meant to look like Vision looked like in, I don't know, the 60s or 70s or whenever the character was created. So I thought that was kind of an interesting nod. And, and Brittany, you mentioned something that I wanted to point out also. You mentioned how the color of red is, is shown on the toaster. The color red is the only kind of color we see for the first two episodes, you know, mostly. Until, yeah. You know, I thought that was kind of interesting. It's like, you know, if you think about it, like that, that's a big color for the Scarlet Witch because she she wears a lot of red. Fish, well, I guess well kind also, of a red, color. also red is uh, generally, and, and I'm sure Brittany knows this as well, in graphic design and other things, it's it's to draw attention and give warning. Uh, right. It's for stop signs, stop lights are red, things like that. So it's like <laughs> warning point. signs kind of flashing in her life. So, um, George, since we're kind of now on this color red you know, topic. What other items did we see in the episodes that had the color red? The blood from uh, that lady when she cut her hand. Dottie. Yeah, when she started noticing that. I think that was the first, like, the second thing that we saw that was red. And, like, she, it seems like she was spooked, too, because when she started hearing on the radio, she's like, like, she started hearing, like, the Wanda needed help or whatever, or... you heard something in the background and her, she, she just looked confused. So I'm curious to see. My thing is that I think someone's like either monitoring her or like doing something. And maybe it's like the people from sword are doing something. I have no idea, but there's a lot of mentions of sword on, uh, yep. there's a, on the notebook. So like when the watching the TV and stuff. So like they're um, running tests on her or something. Yeah, yeah, that's what I think. Yeah, that's what it seems like. Yeah. So I, I kind of want to like draw attention to um, inspiration um, for this show. Um, how many of you all have seen Pleasantville? I have. Okay, Pleasantville stars uh, Tobey Maguire. <laughs> Funny enough, you know. It's a good movie. It's really, it's Spider-Man. pretty good. Right, so um, in Pleasantville, Tobey Maguire's character is really into this old time, um, you know, 1950s style show called Pleasantville. It's black and white, whatever. And he and his sister, Reese Witherspoon, um, somehow get sucked into the show itself. So they're now living characters of Pleasantville. And the same quirkiness, like no one knows what anyone does and like where Pleasantville is. That's kind of like the inspiration for this show. 
in a way. And then also in, in Pleasantville, as as Toby's character and Reese's character kind of like give this wealth of knowledge to the characters of Pleasantville, it, things shift from black and white to color. So that was like right. the first thing I noticed. The second thing um, that I didn't realize until I researched it more was it's very reminiscent of this show rather is reminiscent of the Truman show with Jim Carrey. So think about it. Um, George, you, you're talking about the radio, the guy who's calling out to Wanda on the radio. That's very similar to what had happened in the Truman show when Jim Carrey's character is, is driving and he hears like, you know, uh, every time he makes a turn, he hears it on the radio and that kind of thing. So, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I thought it was kind of interesting. Frank, you look like you have something to say. Red wasn't the only color that was shown those first two episodes. What other color was was shown? The helicopter was red and yellow. Yeah, yeah you're right. Yeah, it's like Iron Man kind of colors. Oh, yeah. yeah, I know red. Red is is, is Scarlet Witch's signature, signature color, and old school Vision suit is yellow. So that could be a okay. Like, yeah. Could be not uh, like Vision suit in the comic books is he has like a um he has like a green and then like his the front of his body is yellow so mm. that could that could play a part like just paying homage to like the signature colors of, of their suits respectively back in the comic book days that makes sense good point and, and you know to go back to that part where we're talking about dotty how she cut her hand you know because her hand was bleeding i wonder like who she might be in the marvel universe like i feel like she's some kind of a character that I mean, obviously, I don't know about. It. I, I haven't, haven't seen anybody. And trust me, there's a lot of stuff online about this show. Like people found like 64 Easter eggs in the first two episodes, which that's a lot. And uh, mm-hmm. there, there's a lot of stuff that's going on that that obviously you know we're not aware of. But um, I feel like she's some kind of character that we'll learn a little bit about in the future episodes. Um, but just to kind of wrap up the first episode of the of this of the series. I want to talk about, I want to ask you what y'all thought about the one scene, the dinner scene where you have the boss and his wife. The wife is played by uh, Deborah Jo Rupp, who was on that 70s show. And surprisingly, she looks the same. She hasn't like aged at all. She looks identical the way she did that 70s show. So she's playing the wife. The husband is like asking Wanda and Vision all these questions and they have no answers. Like, when did you get married? Why don't you have children? all these things and all of a sudden the husband starts to choke on the dinner and the wife looks at him he's choking and she just keeps saying stop it stop it and it feels like a to me it felt like the twilight zone or something like so she confusing. says yeah she says stop it like i don't know maybe 10 times and it's it's so weird because she's like laughing like she's telling him to stop it like it's embarrassing but then is she telling Wanda to stop it? Like, is somebody telling Wanda yeah. to stop it? Because it I, seems like Wanda's trying to kill him. Nathan, jump in. Tell me what you yeah, think. Yeah, no, I, I – that that was a very stark moment in the first episode. And what – the immediate thing I got from that, uh, especially after the Vision, fa- Vision failed to save him until – she said, save him is that yeah. this is Wanda's dream. This Wanda's in control here. And I think there's an outside source that's trying to influence what she thinks, but they have to be careful not to break the illusion because she still believes that this fabrication of her mind is real. Now the why behind all this, I don't know, but that's what that, that, the ending of episode one said to me. Yeah. And if, I don't know if you'll notice, but did you notice how the, the show and the, like the way Elizabeth Olsen is acting where she's playing the housewife in the fifties, the second she tells vision to stop it, she breaks character. And yeah. like, and like the whole show breaks character. The show looks like a current show almost as opposed to like that, that one and Nathan, you know more about this than I would, but like that one cam like studio audience kind of shot yeah. as opposed to like the, the solo cam or whatever one-on-one thing. The whole show, like, Swiss, like, changes, like, break, kind of breaks character and breaks the show in that one moment. Um, I don't know. George and Frank, what what'd y'all think about the, that scene? Like, what's coming next? The mood definitely changed in that scene. Yeah. Because it, it went from, like, lighthearted and all these, like, uh, silly jokes to weird and just very serious because that dude was about to die. And 
I, I don't know. It was just, it was just so awkward. Like the fact that she kept saying and saying and saying it, stop it, stop it, stop it, whatever. And uh, it was just so confusing to me. So I hope we get some clarification on what, what happened. Like if someone was really choking or like if she was doing something to someone and subconsciously, and she had no idea. So I, I'm, I, I'm curious to see what, what, what they, how they're going to explain all this. Yeah, I mean, I mean the, the choking in episode one, the, the blood from um, Dottie, the the uh, the, uh, the red the red and yellow helicopter. These are all like unusual breaks in the show, which tells me that either someone's trying to reach out to her, or she's trying to step out of it, and and like it goes back to regular schedule program again. So um, I I don't know what's going on, but whatever it, she's a pow- she's a powerful mutant. And whatever keeping her yeah. down, I don't know if it's sword that has her in the facility. I don't know if it's shield. Whatever's keeping her down, she can't get out of. And mm-hmm. it seemed like to me the person on, on the radio, because um, you said Renan Park, his character is a former shield agent. Yeah, shield agent, agent turned FBI agent. Yeah, I mean, based on what I can piece together from the trailers, of like I remember seeing like like Renan Park running in a, in a helicopter and like people running after some running running after them. Maybe that's Scarlet Rich finally breaking out of wherever she's at, and that's right. like the result of what's going on. But yeah, like that was a that was a very weird um, scene of the guy choking and Deborah Joe Rump's character just being super calm, saying the same thing over, over, over again. So yeah, and it was like the same cadence too. Like she didn't like it wasn't like stop it, stop it, stop it, stop. Like like there was no change. It was the same thing over and over. Mm-hmm. Um, Brittany, to wrap this up, what what did you think about that scene? Um, your overall thoughts of just how the episode ended. So looking at it hindsight, um, after what what we did see in episode two, and we'll obviously talk about that, but the ending of the dinner party, if you will, um, after Mr. Hart was choking and he kind of, you know, regained his composure, it's like, okay, this actually never happened. Like, we're not going to acknowledge the fact that this happened, right? They said, oh, okay, well, thank you for a lovely meal. They hardly ate, the man almost died. And then the, the husband and wife leave, right? And, right. you know, it, it goes back to that kind of, you know, old school sitcom where uh, something, you know, dramatic happens and then it's like, okay, now it's over, we're just gonna move on. But going, to the whole theory about Wanda, this is like her world, her dream kind of thing. Um, Justin, I think you mentioned this to me the other day about how, um, you know, this is her way of processing her trauma, reliving, like living in a world where she didn't lose vision. Um, it's this this wonderful life, you know, of of the American dream. If you you have the husband, the wife, the 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 home, and what have you. Excuse me, but. The thing is, I, I, I very much relate this episode to that of Civil War, because remember in Civil War, um, after they were the Avengers were in Nigeria, uh, the Accords started coming in, you know, that talk was starting to come into play and Wanda f- felt very like insecure. She's like, I I don't want to, you know, cause harm. I don't, you know, whatever. She almost didn't want to leave the compound until Hawkeye, you know, pretty much told her to get off her ass. So in many ways, it's like, Wanda just wanted to be accepted. She wanted to be normal. She just wanted to be accepted. And this, the show kind of adheres to that, to be that wife that, um, you know, just, just does the wifely things and, and to be accepted and doesn't want to be different. You know, um, it's really interesting to see thus far. And, and like I said, this, this plays more so into uh, the second episode, the ending of the second episode, actually. And, We'll talk about that when we get there. Okay, so let's so and then the actual last thing that happens in the first episode is we see that someone is watching this show on a monitor, which I mean automatically from the beginning of the episode, you know, like because there's literally credits that say starring Wanda Maximoff and the vision, and it's like that's such a weird thing for the show to do. And in the end we see someone's watching it. I thought that was pretty interesting. And and actually that part there when it's when it's pulling back. There's actually a sword logo, like in the upper left hand right. corner. So, so sword is definitely involved in this somehow. Um, the logo on the beekeeper's beekeeper suit too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. and that's that's a big part of uh, episode two, which we're getting to now. 
Um, the main plot line for episode two is there's a neighborhood talent show, and it's very important that uh, that this show happens because it's for the children, which we hear is a motto throughout for the show. For the children. And, um, you know, in, in the in the episode you have – well, I mean, first off, to start off, it's interesting how it opens up and they're they're both sleeping in twin beds. And then, like, Wanda uses her magic to bring the beds together, which, you know, that was a big no-no back in that back in the day. Like, they didn't show married couples literally slept in separate beds on TV till I'm, I'm not even sure when, probably maybe even the 70s. I don't know. Maybe the late 60s, maybe. Um, so to show that was kind of interesting. And then I don't know if you'll notice this, but the, the show has an animated op- opening. Oh, yeah. A very episode. I yeah. Dream of Genie yeah, like. Yeah. Yeah. That was that was pretty cool. Um, and then with this neighborhood talent show, they're they're this magician act. You have you have uh, Vision, who is the magician. His name's Illusion. And then Wanda is his uh, assistant named Glamour. And so that's. It's kind of a funny like play on things, and I don't know like I don't know if Illusion and Glamour are names of other Marvel characters. They very well could be. Maybe that's some kind of nod to that. Um, I'm not sure. But then we get to, you know, we see the we see the helicopter in the bushes, which is actually besides the the red the red dot on the uh, the toaster. It's kind of you know it's our first or second sign of color on the show. Mm-hmm. And the copter has sword on the, uh, the logo on it, and uh, you know we, we mentioned sword several times. Do y'all know what sword means? Do y'all know what the acronym sword stands for? I don't remember what it means. I know they're pretty much the shield version of intergalactic threats. Yeah, extraterrestrials. Um, you kind of see so, that. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, so I looked it up, and sword stands for sentient world observation and response department. Now, apparently the MCU, they don't follow the comics exactly. And so in the MCU's version of S.W.O.R.D., the W does not stand for world. It instead stands for weapon. So sentient weapon observation and response department. And that makes a lot of sense because Wanda, just like Thor, just like Hulk, is a weapon. All these super-powered things are weapons, as they've mentioned in the past. So they're definitely observing her in some way and uh i don't know it's pretty interesting because you think about and i'll kick it over to Brittany because she actually pointed this out to me think about the end of the last mcu movie which is spider-man um mm-hmm. far from home the ver- the end credit scene shows uh and i'll let, let Brittany explain it what, what happens in the end credit of, the, of spider-man so the end credit of the spider-man movie was was really odd because we see uh, ultimately, we see Nick Fury um, uh, commanding from somewhere in space, right? And and you see um, the the scrolls um, that we saw in Captain Marvel, which was bizarre in my opinion. Still, not the greatest movie that ever was made. I think we can all agree on that. But um, it it we learned that Nick Fury um, hasn't always been Nick Fury. If, if one can say it like that. So Nick Fury that we maybe saw in the different Avengers movies, what have you, actually wasn't really him, it was Skrull. But the real Nick Fury has been commanding S.H.I.E.L.D. or now S.W.O.R.D. from outer space. So it seems like this is the direction that um, we're heading into, right? Um, with this show, uh, this show is going to lead directly into the new Doctor Strange movie, as we previously said. And... Um, that's probably what we're going to deal with now is, you know, Avengers, if you will, in space. Yeah. And then you also have, uh, I think it's November, we get the Eternals, which is also a space story, I guess. And they're, I mean, they're like these, like, what, godlike? I mean, Frank, you probably know more about the Eternals. What, what are the Eternals? They're pretty much, they're pretty much celestials. Uh, you have the Deviants, and then you have the, uh, Oh man, I came in the other. I came in the other group of aliens, but basically, Thanos was his mother was a deviant, his, his father was the other one. But um, they're pretty much celestials. Uh, okay. That uh, that mutants. Well, I, that's the thing with this. That's the thing with Disney. Like, I don't know if they're gonna bring. I don't know when when they're gonna bring the mutant aspect back into Marvel. 
but uh, in the comic books, the mutant gene came from the Celestials. It came from the from these gods. Okay. So, um, now I don't that know makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So I don't know if it's a prequel, but if it's a prequel to the beginning of, of Mankind, we could get a Thanos uh, origin story, maybe. So. Okay. Yeah, I, could, I, could well, I mean, that would make sense because the, you know, the, uh, we don't know for sure when the X-Men are going to be in the MCU, but they're going to be in the MCU. So like, so they're going to, they're going to lay the groundwork for that. Cause you know, Marvel, everything is well planned and well thought out. So they're, they're going to like, I would not be surprised if they laid the groundwork for that in the Eternals or even in this show here, because as we've said that, Wanda is this ultra powered mutant who can. I mean, I think in the comics, she literally snaps her fingers and like does away with all the mutants except for a handful or something, from what I understand. So I think, I think we talked about this when we did our rankings a while back about who, who's the strongest or most powerful Avenger out there. And I think, I think I had said Wanda and or Doctor Strange, but Doctor Strange has the assistance of, of an Infinity Stone. Well, not anymore. But I think she arguably is like the strongest or the most powerful Avenger, if you will, out there. Because yeah. she can she can manipulate and she can wield things with her mind. It's it's crazy, you know. Well, I would agree so long as we're not using the word strongest, because as we learned in Thor Ragnarok, powerful. Hulk is the strongest Avenger. Yes. Okay. Fine. <laughs> but I mean, powerful. powerful powerful yeah well I, I will say this in the comic books dr strange had accumulates accumulates so much power that the uh living tribunal actually depowered him because he was he was coming such a powerful threat across them okay. you know the eye, the eye amagato he can he can go through different dimensions so the living tribunal which is like the most powerful celestial being um in marvel he depowered him because he was he was he was becoming too powerful across the multiverse so well, powerful up until he was asked to say the word penguin. <laughs> um, His anyway. undoing. So um, with, with the show, we've already mentioned Dottie a little bit from the last episode, but we, we meet her at this point, and she is known as the queen of the cul-de-sac. She is like the, uh, the organizer, planner, extraordinaire for this uh, talent show. And it's here that we meet another character, and I'm going to see if y'all if y'all know who this person is. We meet a lady named Geraldine, who doesn't seem very confident in that name, and I think with good reason. Do y'all know who that character actually is? I'm just gonna kick it around. Uh, Nathan, do you know who? What's that? You said the character or the actress? No, the character. She says her name's Geraldine. That's not who, who she actually is, though. Hmm. Not a clue. Not a clue. Frank, you have an idea? Black Miss Marvel. Uh, I think you might be right. Is that Monica Rambeau? That's what I thought. That's what I thought when I saw. Yep. Them. I was like, the reason. The reason I thought that because her because her nickname was Geraldine in the comic books. I was like, oh, okay, oh, okay. What are the odds of her being in this sitcom with her? So I was like, maybe, maybe just maybe it's just by coincidence. So I have a question. Have... Yes. Go ahead. Her name is Monica Rambeau. How the hell do you get the nickname Geraldine? I can't remember. I read this comic book when I was, <laughs> but they. Like her husband, her ex-husband, somebody called Jerry and Geraldine. That's that like her nickname. But um, yeah, I thought that, but I was like, uh, how they cross paths in this in, in this world? So I, I didn't, I left it alone. But okay, Monica Rambo, that's what's up. Yeah, and and for MCU purposes, Monica Rambo is the little girl in Captain Marvel, which of course is in the set in the '90s. So by current day, you know she's a thirty something year old woman you know so it's uh it, it makes sense um okay so let's get to the talent show i think the talent show is is a you kind of get to see a lot of like you really get to see uh the comedic chops of elizabeth olsen and uh paul Bettany. they're both pretty funny obviously uh we find out vision he uh he was given big red gum there that, that word again is red and the the big red gum literally gums up his mechanical system because after all he is a robot and so he shows up to the talent show and he's like acting like he's drunk and i, I thought that was like 
for being like a cheesy kind of thing, I think they played that so well. Like, I, I don't know that you could do that any better than what they did. And I think they probably did it better than those shows that used to do that kind of stuff back in the 60s and so. Um, Paul so Bettany's Paul Bettany's performance at, at that moment with the talent show remind me so strong of his character, Jeffrey Chaucer in A Night's Tale. Just the very loud, very, you know, ah, kind of yeah. personality. Uh, it was fantastic. It was just, it was great to see him um, kind of channel that side of himself. By the way, I love Big Red. I love Big Red gum. It's like one of my favorites. Very controversial back in the day. I will say that. What's that? Why? From what I read, it was kind of like, I don't know, anarchist kind of. Oh. I don't know. The, de Commie. the devil, the devil's gum or something? Probably. Okay. Because it was spicy. Hey. Yeah. I, I haven't had that in a long time. I Actually, I, I, I mean, I've. When I think Big Red, I think of the soda more than I think of the gum. I actually yeah. forgotten about the gum completely. So that was a that was a kind of a cool callback for me. Um, the talent show. I don't know if y'all noticed this, but the, the banner at the top of the talent show, they have talent show, and then it says dot 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 for the children. And people say that line. Does anybody? Can anybody explain to me what for the children means? I'm gonna start with Nathan. Do you have any idea what that means? Um. Yes. Okay. It's for the children. <laughs> hey. Okay. Would, would you care to elaborate on what for the children means? But what children? Where are the children? Well, the it's for the children. What children? There are no children in the show. Well. If you fast forward like 15 minutes in the show, there will be children because we see yeah. that Wanda suddenly becomes pregnant. And from what I've seen in the comics, in the comics, they have Wanda and Vision have a have twin boys who are also super powered android robots, you know, or whatever. And uh, I think those uh, those children maybe fall in the wrong hands from what I'm guessing. Um, oh, ooh, I'm going to I'm going to interrupt real, real quick, because we do have someone who's commenting, commenting on the show as we're live. Thank you, uh, Mark, for joining us. We appreciate it. Mark says Big Red is all he drinks and chews. A. Eh? <laughs> and then the for the children of Thanos. It mm. could be maybe. I mean, Thanos like babies. <laughs> <laughs> So many babies. I mean, I mean, Thanos did. I mean, Thanos, the Black Order. He did refer. He did refer to them as his children, and so yeah, they could so. play a part. But I mean, we. I thought he was gone. Like, let's don't do like Star Wars and bring back the same bad guys. You know what I mean? Uh. Like, although I guess like, <laughs> did Thanos die in Endgame? Uh, he got his head chopped off. No, well, no, no, I, I know, but the the other Thanos. Yeah, so both, both Thanos have died. So the the the, the main time my Thanos died, and then twenty fourteen Thanos came back into the main time my he also died. yeah. So didn't he kind of like just he like got unmade? Away? Yeah, he was unmade. Yeah, by a okay. snap so of I a guess, finger. Yeah. Right there, you go. So I guess Thanos is gone. Well, that's a good guess because they do talk about the children a lot. With well, Thanos, he was so that, he was inevitable. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Can we, um, can we talk about the raciness, the raciness of the show? Like, yeah, like, go for it. Disney kind of like, I was, I'm surprised by Disney, man. Like, like you know, Agnes with some of the uh, sexual in the windows. She was talking to, uh, to to Black Widow. I mean, Black Widow. Scarlet Witch about. Scarlet Witch, yeah. <laughs> right. And then like the lingerie Scarlet Witch had on when 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 Vision came home with the husband. Yeah. Like, listen, she like, looked fabulous in that gown. I want one. Oh no, absolutely. I, I'm just, I guess I'm surprised. I've never seen Disney really like toe the line of like sexuality before. I saw like a couple kissing scenes or whatever, but I'm like, okay, Disney, this this is kind of dope. Okay, I'm I'm feeling this. So, um, Frank's feeling yeah. it as long as there's lingerie involved. Shocking. Hey, hey, <laughs> I'm just, I'm a man, aren't I? I'm just saying. Oh goodness, Frank. So uh the, the talent show thing, one other thing I wanted to point out with the talent show. 
I thought it was interesting how, you know, because Vision is like drunk because of the gum and it's messed up his system, he is using his powers to pull off these these magic tricks. And so Wanda's having to having to cover for him. I thought that was pretty interesting how she did that. And, you know, he's the one scene he's floating above everybody and then she had to like make it seem like, oh, there's a rope holding him up and you know, then he, he makes the hat go through his body and she has to show, oh, because we have all these mirrors. Behind us, that's, why. <laughs> that's how mirrors work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was pretty funny. I, I think that stuff, like they did that so well, you know, it's, yeah. I mean, it's meant to be that kind of cheesy, but it's like, man, that's like so good. Um, I was just really impressed by, by the whole show. But uh, so fast forward to the end and uh, you know, Wanda suddenly becomes pregnant. Right. And then we hear this sound outside. And so Wanda and Vision go outside their home. We see this beekeeper guy coming out of a manhole. And Wanda looks at him and says, no. And then she re- rewinds the show. And then they go back to the house and then everything turns into color. I guess we're off to the 70s. What did y'all think about that ending? Like, do you have any theories on anything? Or like, what, what are your thoughts on that? I'll, I'll kick it to Britain first. The very fact that she saw that this, why a beekeeper of all professions, first off, why is a beekeeper coming out of a manhole? Okay, whatever. Hopefully that'll be answered. But if if this beekeeper is of a different organization, be it SWORD or um, a, another organization from that, uh, the fact that she either recognize the logo, recognize him or the profession, and is like, no, I'm gonna rewind this and make it the ending that I want. That kind of further solidifies this. This is her world. This is her dream. I don't think there's really someone who's controlling her per se at this point. I think this is just her way of dealing and and getting to live a life that she ultimately wasn't going to have with vision right so and i really am curious as to how a toaster that is vision and wanda a human being could have children anyway but um that's that's beside the point but it 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 really kind of took me back took me back a little bit just like okay well she recognizes she changed the ending what all does this mean and if that's the case, if she could change the ending of this, you know, if let's say she had stuck around, you know, didn't dissolve at the end of Infinity War, you know, could she have rewound time to, uh, you know, undo what had been done? In essence, yes, she could have, except she was one of the ones that faded with the snap. No, I know. But what so, I'm saying, had she not been. Yeah. Yeah. I believe she could have. Um but we don't know the extent to her powers versus the power of the infinity stones either. So yeah, definitely. George, what did you think of the ending uh, with Wanda being pregnant and the beekeeper? I think she's seeing what she wanted to see in her head. Like the, like that's what she's imagining. And she's living out this fairy tale that she had uh, this life that she was going to have with vision before he died. And now that she can't bring him back, like she's still living in that reality in her head. And I think that beekeeper was someone like someone from Sora, like bringing her out from that her reality, and she's just trying to stay in there as long as possible before she's brought back to real life. With that, I'm with that. Frank, what about you? I, I agree with George. I think the variation of um, of post traumatic stress post traumatic stress syndrome of like trying to cope with the loss of a vision or not coping with it and creating this awesome reality of like this happy life of kids and and all of that and I think the beekeeper was a was symbolism of sword trying to reach out to her to snap to snap her out of it because sword is a is a they they monitor intergalactic threats and if she's having these I kind of compare it to have you guys seen the last Wolverine movie so, yep. Logan, Logan. Yeah. Yeah, Logan. So yep. every time Professor X has like these aneurysms, like everything within like a fifty mile radius is, is like in danger of being destroyed because of because of his power. 
I'm thinking it's that same issue. I'm thinking what whatever she's going through, these uh this PTSD moment, I think Sword is worried about the actual actual reality being compromised. And I think she's on the either on the stress test and they're trying to reach out to her to get out of to get to, like snap out of it. So that's my that's my, you know, prediction. I, I mean I don't know, but it just seems like she's so powerful that for Sword to be involved, she has to be a threat in some sort of fashion. I agree. Nathan, yeah. what do you think about the uh, the ending of episode two? Yeah, I, I'm pretty much feeling the same as you all are. I also found the, and this is the one thing where I'm like, well, this 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 might mean something different. I still feel very much the same as George and Frank, but I, I did find also the symbolism of a beekeeper very interesting because a beekeeper looks after the bees and probably, I don't know a lot about beekeeping that probably has a name besides beekeeping for all I know, but I don't know much about that, but I do know that part of the reason that they harvest or, or, or grow these bees and there's probably a queen bee among them is to collect the honey, which makes me wonder what is the honey if she is the queen bee? Man, those are good questions. That was poetic, bro. Stuff. Good stuff. I took that as like a sexual innuendo, but never mind. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe baby toasters. I don't know. Maybe that's I'm what they're saying, after. <laughs> she, she just like miraculously became you know, sure. pregnant. You know, are we talking like the Virgin Mary here yeah. or is she, does she have the honey? I mean, maybe she's like, like plug and play. <laughs> <laughs> maybe My so. God. <laughs> Well, uh, with that, um, I guess that, that wraps up episode two. Uh, by the way, honey is underrated uh, for putting on toast. It's actually pretty good. I like it. Um, I think Brittany has some uh, has some uh, trivia questions she wants to kick around, some WandaVision trivia questions. So, uh, Brittany, go for it. Uh, not so much trivia questions per se, but, you know, just trivia that I have found. Um, so we've kind of already addressed, like, you know, that this seems to be like a show within a show. Uh, we've talked about, obviously, the different classic shows that this um, WandaVision kind of reminds us of. We do know the voice of the radio that was on the radio, thanks to Justin. Um, and I briefly talked about the significance of the uh, commercials that are Stark Tech and Strucker. Um, so some other things that I just want to talk about kind of deal with production in general. Um, so I, you know, did a little bit of research and and saw that the house that Wanda and Vision are is the same house used for National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Justin, I know that's one of your favorites. Oh, I wow. Believe. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. And, and the house that's next door uh, being Dottie's house, if you will, that is the same house that was used in Lethal Weapon. Um, and both of these houses are on the Warner Brothers Studios back lot. So I thought that was kind of fun to incorporate, um, you know, that into the show. It's um, interesting. They, sorry, Brent, let me just jump in. It's interesting they would use the Warner Brothers lot for a Disney show. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Like, hmm. why did they use the Krypton set or something? You know, like, or the Bat. Cave. <laughs> that cave. <laughs> I, that's kind of strange that a Warner Brothers property would be on a Disney thing. I don't know. Anyway. I don't know. Um, so specifically with episode two, these are the little trivia bits that I found. The title sequence that starts with the six stars twinkling in a circle actually refers to the infinity stones that gave Wanda and Vision their powers in the MCU. So if you that's like, hmm. you know, you really have to dive in for that one. If you know, and I think we can confidently say that if you really don't know who these characters are if you have no prior knowledge to the mcu this is like a bad show to start off with because yeah. you have yeah. got to know who these characters are you've got to have the understanding of the infinity stones and and that kind of thing so um yeah if you're starting off with wandavision don't you need to go back and watch all phase one two and three movies um before you start on this yeah topic with the infinity stones the cabinet the the magician's cabinet that was used in the show um you can see on top a shape identical to one of the infinity stones it's likely that it's the mind stone um the same one that vision has on his forehead and that was you know fundamental for the acquisition of uh, wanda's powers as well um 
And last but not least, this is really, really funny. It's a it's a callback to Ant-Man. The trophy that Wanda and Vision received for winning um, the inaugural comedy section of the talent competition is exactly the same as the trophy Scott Lang had received from his daughter being the world's greatest <laughs> grandma. <laughs> Oh, uh, that's nice. really cool. That's <laughs> hilarious. Because um, awesome. I know, I also, Frank, I'm going to call you out. I know that movie was the first time you're like, man, I want a daughter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was. I was I was pretty impressed by that movie. It, it, it shockingly impressed me. Yeah. Is it, is the Mind Stone yellow as well, if I'm not mm-hmm. mistaken? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, because... I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm like digging. I'm trying to dig deep into this red and yellow color helicopter. Um, I mean, yeah, red and yellow color. I know yeah. Vision's yellow and his monster is yellow too. So I don't know. Maybe maybe it's just paying homage to, to the to the suits, the color of the suits of these characters, or, or what? I don't know, but it has to be something. There's definitely a lot of symbolism. I feel um, like with the Iron Man and what you said with the old comics that. Vision's, you know, costume was was yellow, and of course Scarlet Witch is you know, red, so that's why I'm wearing red. Um, but yeah, you know, um, Justin, you said something about 64 Easter eggs in just the first episode. That's like, Marvel? yeah, I went, I did like a, a YouTube deep dive the other day, and like, you know, there's always Easter eggs for everything, and people are finding stuff. And I watched one of them, and this guy found a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff there's no way I would have known. So. Um, Again, interesting. You, you've got to know who these characters are. You've got to know the backstory of, of yeah. their significance and, and what have you. But I actually am very happy to see Elizabeth Olsen and Paul Bettany on the screen again because they, they have great chemistry together, I think, even in this cheesy sitcom format. It's, it's great chemistry. Yeah, I agree. So that, that wraps up WandaVision. I've just got a couple little items to add. Um, Last week, some more MCU news. We uh, Deadline.com reported this, and everyone else ran with it. The talks of uh, Chris Evans possibly in, in a contract negotiation to return as Captain America. What do y'all think about that? I'll throw it to George first. What do you think about Chris Evans coming back as Captain America? Uh, like on the TV show or the movie or what's happening? It's not clear. It, it, they said that they don't think it would be like a Captain America standalone, but he might make – like cameo kind of appearances as Captain America, which to me makes sense, you know, depending on old man. I I don't think so. I think it's going to be like, uh, you still get it, you know, just saying, I think it's, I think it's going to be like, um, I think it's it's dependent on the shows and the time period in which the movies and stuff come out. Like if there's any kind of flashback, if it makes sense for Captain America to be in the flashback, I think that's what's going to happen. But that, then I'm down. I'm, I don't I'm, know. I'm, I'm all for that. I had one question for y'all. So you said uh, if they had like flashbacks or whatever. So how is this going to mess with the timeline of since Black Widow is supposed to come out with this movie, like before before this show? Well, Black I think Widow's Black movie. Black Widow. That was the time in between Infinity War and Endgame. No. Yeah, because no, I mean, I don't know. between so, War and Infinity War. Yeah. Between what? Civil War and Infinity War. Ah, uh, okay. Is in between that those two movies. And what about the Falcon when a soldier? So that's after. That's after, that's in, after game. in game. Yeah. Yeah. Present day. So did you say that that show was supposed to come out before this one? Yeah. It was supposed so to come ori- out in the fall. So originally, you know, Black Widow was supposed to come out in May of 2020. Mm-hmm. That didn't happen because of the pandemic. And then Falcon Winter Soldier was supposed to come out in the fall of 2020. That got pushed back too, and so I guess WandaVision was already ready, and so they moved WandaVision up. I, I mean, obviously, I don't think that the order of these shows matters as much as maybe we thought, because I, I had heard that the reason why they were holding up Falcon and Winter Soldier is because something happens in the Black Widow movie that affects that show. But yeah. obviously, that's not the case, because now Falcon and Winter Soldier is coming out in March, and Black Widow is scheduled for May again. We'll see, you know, with the pandemic and vaccines and stuff, are enough people going to go see it? I'm not sure. Or maybe it'll be on Disney Plus. I don't know. But uh, now they've swapped the orders of those two. So obviously it doesn't really matter when those come out, I guess. 
That's what I was wondering. Cause like it, so it must matter if they waited, they were trying to wait for it to, so they can release the show after that. If there's something, so it, it maybe it'll be small, but I think it does affect it somehow. Yeah. So Frank, what do you think about Chris Evans maybe coming back to play Captain America? I'm with it, man. I mean, you, you know me. When it comes to these castings, Robert Downey, is Iron Man to me forever. Uh, Bozeman's Black Panther forever. Chris Evans, Captain America forever in my mind. Like that, those are perfect castings. So if, if they can find a way to to bring him back without screwing up the Marvel timeline, I'm with it. Like I, I love Chris Evans. I think he's an awesome actor. And like I, I said this in our in our in our group chat last week. I'm like, dude, you're making X amount of million dollars of of playing this character who cares about being typecasted you're making millions like you're not like i get it you want to do other things don't want to be typecast and all that dude it's, make your money bro if there's an opportunity to come back come back yeah and I, I think that like from what i've read and heard like the the marvel people all kind of get along and it's all kind of a big hangout everything is shot in atlanta so they all just kind of live in atlanta for a couple months and they all like it so i mean obviously the pandemic maybe affects what they might do there, but uh, it sounds like they're just like, hey, you know, what if we throw you some money? You want to come back and hang out with us? And it sounds like that's what they're doing. And um, but then you know, Chris Evans himself came out and said that like whenever, whenever that report was was released or whatever, he said that's news to me on Twitter. So now who knows what that means? You know. Well, there's been time yeah, just like that dick pic was you know news to him on Twitter. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But Chris has a dick pic out there. Oh, uh, you didn't Frank, hear about we'll talk that? about this. We'll talk about this after the show. <laughs> what? Why am I still hearing about this? What? <laughs> anyway. Oh. Okay. Well, anyway. anyway. Well, uh, but, well like, there's been times where actors and actresses of Marvel have said, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. And then, like, four months later, they show up as a yeah. show or whatever. So I don't – that's probably because I'm just, you know, having the hush map and not, you know, not spoiling anything. So – I'm not, I'm not I'm not surprised by his response regarding that. Well, yeah. uh I have I have just one thought of on it of him coming back as Captain America. I I feel like that's cheating like all the fans of the entirety of the Marvel universe in doing that. And the reason I say that is I think he should come back as an X-Men cuz he's already been in the Fantastic 4 and the Avengers. So <laughs> Oh man, yes. Listen, he can come back and he can he can still get it. All right, he's he's daddy right there. Damn. <laughs> yeah. So, so so what happens to Josh Brolin's Cable and Thanos? Is he coming back as Cable again? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Frank, what an excellent segue because my last item is about Deadpool three. Now this is this is not a surprise, but it was finally confirmed that Deadpool three will in fact be in the MCU. So my question to y'all, I mean, I know we're all down for that. How would y'all like for Deadpool 3 to be introduced into the MCU? Like, what would you do with the movie? I'm going to throw it to, I'll throw it to George first. What, what are your thoughts on how, what, what should happen for Deadpool to enter the MCU? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I don't George, for some reason I thought like he had, because like you're kind of moving your head like yeah. you knew something. I was like, he's got no, something, not, so. Not yet. I'm just trying. I was trying to think, so you beat me to it. So let someone else go first. Let me think. Okay. All right. I, I got. I got something. I got something. Go for it. Uh, just because they made such a good pair up in the comics, I'd like to see him come in with Spider Man. Uh, that'd be cool. Yeah. That'd be dope. I I'll be with that. I'll be, but see, I, I've also read with the Spider Man movie that's coming out. And it doesn't been confirmed yet, but um, Daredevil might, might come back as well. But once the Netflix contract is up, and Daredevil, Daredevil oh, it's up, it's up. Oh, is is it pushing open Netflix now? Yeah, like it's up, and there's reports that 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 actor was on set for Spider Man Three, whatever they're calling Spider Man Three. I've heard it's gonna be called Home for the Holidays. Christmas yeah. Movie. Okay, so, uh, so it, yeah. it might be true then. So and apparently, what, what I read online. Was that he might come back as Spider Man's, uh, you know, Spider Man's lawyer or, or people lawyer. lawyer in the right. in upcoming Spider Man movie. So if that's true, then that could open up a whole new, 
you know, Pandora's box of characters coming back mm-hmm. in these different movies. But um, to pi- to piggyback um, off of Nathan, I think I don't know. I think De- I think Deadpool is such a a great piece of art, and it's R rated. I would like it to be separate from the MCU, like have its own world. Like, but it's, it's gonna be R. It's gonna be R rated in the MCU. It's gonna be R rated in the MCU. I guess my question is, how do you how do you culminate that with other Marvel movies that are PG that kids go see? Kids go to public school; they hear far worse than they <laughs> see and hear no, Deadpool. I'm right. just saying. No, you're right, there, Brittany. I, I get that, but you're Disney. You, you don't want to create any backlash either. Like I, I get what you're saying, but like, but like Disney has Disney has they have this persona this property of cookie cutter and like no yeah yeah only killing moms <laughs> yeah Which bambi's is- mom gone <laughs> old yeller see you later <laughs> kid i'll never forget when travis killed old yeller i'm gonna kill that kid if i ever find travis if he's still living <laughs> he's got a beating coming his way for real <laughs> That dog loved him, took care of him, <laughs> saved his life multiple times, and he shoots him because he gets rabies. Ever heard of rabies shots, bud? Hey, <laughs> don't give up on the dog. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I want to I wanna call back. I love how Frank, once again, was, like, saying for the children. You know, like, with your <laughs> – with your, with your uh, <laughs> pool talk. What a callback. Frank's like giving us segues and callbacks. Like he's like, he's like the mastermind of this show. You know, like I, I appreciate it. Um, uh, George, do you have any, uh, have you thought of something for Deadpool? No, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Deadpool blank space. Like we're just, Maybe maybe like Deadpool begins instead of like Batman begins. We just have a, like a, an origin story. Um, Brittany, what do you think about Deadpool? How should he enter the MCU? With DMX. <laughs> With DMX. <laughs> X going to give it to you, right? That's what I've always heard. Um, you know, um, so this is not my idea. I wish it were, but I read a really funny idea for Deadpool 3. And the idea was, you know, the the MCU is going to, all the characters that were on Fox, the MCU is going to do better versions of them. And so someone said they should have Deadpool kill off all the Fox characters. <laughs> just bring back all the Fox X-Men and everything else. And just he just one by one systematically erases them. And that's how he enters the MCU. Dude, and I think that's how the, that's the movie right there. It's awesome. I, I need to see Deadpool with with Wolverine, just because the the interaction that Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman have with one another is fantastic. I need to see it yeah. on the silver screen. I, I I need to see it. And you know, if if Deadpool, if and when he ever interacts with the new Wolverine, who's ever playing the MCU Wolverine, he's going to make a comment like, "You're not the same guy." I mean, it'll be funnier than that, but it'll be something like, "You've changed." Is it Stewart or McAvoy? <laughs> Right. I can never keep up with the timelines. <laughs> the jokes in those movies are so awesome. Like making fun of Batman versus Superman, making fun of the X Men. Like it's just. I don't want it to change. I hope. They say it's R rated. I hope it stays R rated. I hope it's the same stuff. And, I do too. I think that's the only yeah. way that, like, at this point, much how we. I think we can all safely agree about Robert Downey's always going to be Iron Man, Chris Evans, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Ryan Reynolds is always going to be Deadpool as long as the delivery is the same. If the content it's is permitted the same, to be the same, it yeah. has to be the same. Like it's not going to be Deadpool if if it starts getting you know watered down because you know the the audience is you know it's a different audience because it's Disney. I mean, but what yeah. what if they gave him like Cyclop laser Cyclops laser eyes and like blades stuck in his arms? And like stitch his mouth shut. Would he? Would he? Would he stop being Deadpool then? <laughs> I don't think we want to see the Deadpool again. <laughs> Although I do appreciate that it was still Ryan Reynolds playing Deadpool. Yeah, I do. I think that, that answers your question. Pretty much. 
<laughs> so so kill the Fox universe, join the Disney universe, join the MCU. Sounds good to me. Oh man. Um, so so as we wrap up here, uh, I just want to thank everybody for watching and listening to us. Uh, Brittany, if you wouldn't mind, could you explain how people who could you know who are maybe watching this for the first time or listening for the first time, how do you how can you find the Watchers in the Basement podcast? All right, so we are doing a video podcast that will also be stripped down to our audio pad podcast. I can't even talk right now. Uh, where you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, if you're into audio podcasts only. Otherwise, you can check out this video podcast here on Facebook. Uh, we do Facebook Lives now because of the pandemic. Otherwise, uh, we do recordings that we upload to our YouTube channel. So be sure to head over to YouTube, sh subscribe, hit that notification bell. Also, make sure you to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just simply typing in the Watchers in the Basement. And don't forget to use hashtag Watchers Basement when you are talking about our podcast. And let us know what you want us to review uh, after WandaVision. I'm sure we're going to do, you know, Falcon and Winter Soldier and God knows what else comes out. Oh, Loki. Okay, y'all, I don't know if y'all know this, but we're, we're in the midst of 40 consecutive weeks of Marvel content. <laughs> nice. So we go from, from uh, WandaVision to the Falcon Winter Soldier to Loki to Black Widow. And then after that, I'm not sure, but there's something coming right after that, too. So we have a lot of MCU to talk about. I am in it. I am in it to win it. Okay. Thank you, Brittany. Uh, so, yeah, thanks again for, for watching. Uh, we'll be back next week with Episode 3. So we hope to make this our tradition. WandaVision Wednesday will break down the Friday episode. So for, uh, for Nathan, for George, for Frank, and for Brittany, this is Justin. We're signing off, and we'll see you next week. Bye.